Tonight we have the honor of hosting Ken Walsh, an accomplished journalist and author of Prisoners of the White House, The Isolation of America's Presidents, and The Crisis of Leadership. And thank you to Ken for being so willing to reschedule our program with us. Uh, Ken Walsh is the White House correspondent for U.S. News and, Re and World Report and has served in this capacity for over a quarter of a century, making him one of the longest, service white, longest serving White House correspondents in history. In this role, he also writes a column for U.S. News called The Presidency and a blog called Ken Walsh's Washington. Ken is the author of six books, including Family of Freedom, Presidents and African Americans in the White House, which he spoke about at the library in 2011. Ken is a frequent contributor on radio and TV. He is former president of the White House Correspondents Association and has won the most prestigious awards for White House coverage, including the Gerald R. Ford Journalism Prize for Distinguished Reporting on the Presidency, which he has won three times. President Harry Truman called the White House the Great White Jail, and President Clinton called it the crown jewel of the federal penitentiary system. In recent years, West Wing insiders have called it the bubble. In Prisoners of the White House, Ken Walsh takes us inside an increasingly insular White House and examines which presidents, from Franklin Roosevelt to Barack Obama, have succeeded or failed in staying connected with an ever-changing country as they tackled one of the greatest challenges of the American presidency, isolation. Please join me in welcoming Ken Walsh to the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Geyer. Thanks, Elaine and Kate and all the wonderful staff here at the Gerald Ford Library and Museum. And uh, I have been here for two months waiting for this to happen since the shutdown. <laughs> the, the room was a little cramped, but I got used to it. Uh, but uh, again, thanks for coming. You know, I remember when I first started covering the White House and I walked through the Northwest Gate in May of 1986, a long time ago. And shortly after I started covering the White House, it struck me how abnormal the life of the president is. I mean, not only is the president treated like a pasha or a king in many ways, but many times uh, the president just is unable to really connect with everyday people. And George Reedy, who was Lyndon Johnson's, one of his senior advisors, uh, wrote a book called The Twilight of the Presidency uh, many years ago. It's my book. It's in some ways an attempt to update. And he said that the, one of the signal problems of the American presidency is a difficulty of, of keeping in touch with reality. And I think if anything, it's gotten even more challenging since then. It has nothing to do with partisanship, it has nothing to do with Democrats or Republicans or liberals or conservatives. It's just basically the nature of the office is so, uh, so burdensome, uh, and I'll come back to a lot of the reasons for this as, as we talk about this. But, uh, and also, by the way, I wanted to show you some scenes from the White House that people generally don't get to see. I think you'd be interested in some of that. But basically, I'm gonna start with Franklin Roosevelt uh, in the history part, which, who I consider the first modern president. Uh, but I wanted to start uh, immediately off with the presidency of Barack Obama, or in our incumbent, and talk about some of the positives and the negatives of this bubble uh, that we have. This is President Obama's inauguration in January of 2009. I was there for this. I don't know if, if any of you were there, but basically it was a tremendously jubilant crowd. Usually a, an inauguration crowd, you know, this is from the steps of the Capitol. It goes back to the Washington Monument, which is the obelisk at the top of the picture. This went all the way back to the Lincoln Memorial, this crowd. A vast crowd, uh, people felt that the country had perhaps gotten beyond our sad history of slavery and segregation and prejudice and had elected the first African American president. So right off the bat, President Obama makes history because he's the first African American president. And um, we were talking at dinner a little while ago about sort of what this does to a president when the president makes history right from the beginning. Um, and President Obama, and I'll come back to this uh, a little later, and you, you see this in the health care issue and so many other things, is sort of surrounded by an inner circle of idolizers, people who idolize him, who want to protect him, who want to, they don't like to bring him bad news. And I think that's one problem he's had with this whole health care situation. 
But basically, going back to his inauguration, he takes over, uh, and President Obama had a tremendous uh, reputation for being this charismatic figure, this guy who did mingle with people, was energized by people, and to some extent that was true, at least during the campaign, and he retained that uh, image when he got into the White House. Um, presidents, part of the positive side of this bubble that they're in is that they make history. Uh, president Obama, as any president, uh, gets to speak joint sessions of Congress. Uh, he's one of only 43 individuals who have been president of the United States. He's our 44th president, but Grover Cleveland was counted twice for non-consecutive terms. There's only 43 individuals who've had this job, and so it's a tremendous opportunity to shape history and to uh, do things that most other people just never get even close to doing, and that's a tremendous positive of the job, and presidents love that. And this is a wonderful picture I like to show, just showing the arc of our history. This is a famous portrait of a George Washington that hangs uh, near the Oval Office with President Obama in front of it. Um, it's interesting because, of, of course, Washington had slaves in the White House, so Obama could very well have been a slave of George Washington in those days. Uh, of course, it wasn't the White House then, it was the president's residence. But it just shows how far we've come, and that's part of the history-making nature of the presidency that is, uh, is part of, the, as I say, the positive side of all this. Now, uh, other positives, the Air Force One. I wrote a book about Air Force One. You can see Mount Rushmore there at the bottom left. Uh, this is a wonderful picture of the plane. Every president that I've dealt with, and I've talked, covered five of them now, always say that the thing they miss most <coughs> was Air Force One. <laughs> Uh, having traveled uh, a lot recently, including getting here from Washington, uh, it's a tremendous advantage not to have to wait for a flight, ever, because the president's plane is always given first priority, and they freeze the airports so no other plane gets near them. They cut a two-mile swath in the sky so no other plane gets close. It's like flying in a first-class hotel suite, so every president loves Air Force One. Tremendous perk of office, but of course it's part of that isolating a uh, series of perquisites the presidents have because nobody else really gets to fly this way as the president does. And I think it, it does end up being sort of an isolating situation. Camp David. <clears throat> Camp David is the presidential retreat in the Maryland mountains. Another step toward this bubble nature notion. Uh, a lot of people have uh, their own retreats in their daily lives. But pre uh, president Obama and any president has Camp David uh, where only he gets to use, he can allow others to use it, but basically it's a wonderful place that has tremendous perks of its own. So the president has his own getaway that the president can go to. Again, another step toward this bubble that we're talking about. Um, the White House itself is filled with amenities. Uh, in my book I talk about some 130, 140 staffers who are absolutely devoted to the president, absolutely uh, just want to do everything they can for the president, so the president doesn't have to do anything that you or and I do. Uh, doesn't have to go shopping, doesn't have to wait for the plumber, doesn't have to uh, fix the television. Everything is done for the president. And uh, this may make not such a great difference in, in industry or in other occupations, but for the president, this is another step away from everyday life. So the president doesn't really understand how everyday people live. And uh, that's a, a, a significant problem for the president. This is another little moment at the White House I thought you'd be interested in seeing. This is the family theater. Another thing the president has that others don't have, uh, a theater, I've been in this theater, the, the president and Michelle, the first lady, are looking at a 3D movie here. Uh, I think it's Avatar, by the way, in case you're interested. But it's another one of these perks, so the president doesn't have to leave the White House for anything, because everything is right there. There's a bowling alley, tennis courts, there's all kinds of things that don't get a lot of publicity, but the, that the president gets to use that uh, um, others don't. I mentioned the household staff. Um, this is another example. By the way, uh, you can see the Secret Service guy standing there in the, in the doorway. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But uh, the, the butlers, uh, the staffers, just are absolutely devoted to the presidency. Not just the president, but the presidency. This is a case where the butler is giving the president a cool towel to refresh him after a speech. Uh, just like I say, every sort of whim or um, desire the president has is taken care of at the White House. And that's not even by the, the official political staff, that's by the household staff, the institutional staff. The political staff, again, are part of this notion of idolizers who don't want to uh, bring bad news to the president and so on. But uh, so basically what I've talked about so far is more of the positive sides. There are many 
negative sides, of course, to being present as well. Uh, the ultimate negative, of course, is the security problem. This is President Reagan in 1981, not long after he was take, took office as president, the assassination attempt at the Washington Hilton. He's being pushed into his car uh, after John Hinckley took shots at him. Uh, there's this, the back story of this is that uh, you can see the look on Reagan's face. Uh, he knew he was something was wrong. He thought that one of the agents was handling him too roughly and had broken one of his ribs. Of course, he'd been shot. One of the bullets ricocheted off the side of the limousine and penetrated his chest and came close to his heart. And by the time he got to the hospital, uh, he was near death, uh, but he insisted that, uh, insisting on the dignity of the office, he insisted on getting out of the limousine by himself, hitching up his pants, buttoning his jacket, and walking into the hospital on his own. He, then he collapsed, and as I say, he almost died. So that's sort of the ultimate negative side of being president. Uh, since I've covered the White House, by the way, it's been very clear that every time we have an incident like this, I didn't, wasn't there for this incident with Reagan, but every time we have an incident like this, an attempt on the life of the president, going back to President Kennedy, uh, the attempts on Gerald Ford's life, uh, the uh, attempt on Reagan's life, the security goes up and it never goes back to the way it was. It's more and more intense all the time. If the president was giving the speech here, there would be Secret Service agents on either side of him, all along the walls, some of them in plain clothes in the audience, out in the parking lot, in the halls, everywhere. So you wonder how a president can have any kind of a normal human interaction with this unbelievable security cordon around him all the time. Uh, presidents have tried to break out of this, uh, but after a while they realize that uh, this is something they need for their protection, so they go along with it. But they really get uh, very upset sometimes at the extent of the security around them. And this is one of the reasons why this, uh, the presidents get isolated, because the security is so intense. Um, I remember when President Clinton took over, uh, younger presidents have this problem more than older presidents. He uh, got up in the middle of the night and he went to the kitchen to make himself a sandwich. He was known for this. And he uh, found a Secret Service agent and a household staff member in the kitchen waiting for him. And he said, it's 2 o'clock in the morning. Why are you here? The agent said, well, I'm here to protect you, Mr. President. And the household staffer says, I'm here to serve you, Mr. President. So he said, well, isn't this the most protected building in the world? I mean, there are Secret Service agents everywhere. Couldn't you at least not be in the kitchen at all hours? <laughs> so they cleared out the third floor residence for him. Some presidents get along better with this and some don't. Uh, but uh, President Clinton was one who did not, and he did try to break out of the bubble, which I'll come back to. But uh, security is a tremendous problem for presidents to deal with in having any kind of a normal life. Uh, this is uh, an example of presidents, the nature of the job itself, the decisions they have to make, sometimes are very anguishing, sometimes uh, isolate them from the country. This is Lyndon Johnson in the Roosevelt Room, I believe, at the White House. Um, his son-in-law was Chuck Robb, who's a former senator and governor of, New, of Virginia. He at the time was a, a combat soldier in Vietnam, and he had sent his father-in-law a tape. You can see the tape there at the bottom, one of the old reel-to-reel -reel tapes, a tape from the battlefield, what it was like for the real soldier in Vietnam, how things perhaps were not going as well as President Johnson was being told by the military brass. And you can see the, reac the reaction that Lyndon Johnson had. Here is his member of his own family, is being affected by his decisions. And it was very anguishing for him and very difficult for him to deal with. And uh, the Vietnam War was a main reason why in the book I identify Lyndon Johnson as one of the presidents who really um, was isolated. By the end of his presidency, uh, he could not really, he was almost literally a prisoner of the White House. He could not really make speeches around the country except at military bases where there would be respect for the commander in chief and on conservative college campuses because the protests became so virulent and often violent. So he was really stuck in the bubble of this White House. And this is a guy who was known for, for be, liking to be around people, for reaching out to people. But by the end of his presidency, he became increasingly bitter because he was a prisoner of the White House. And his Vietnam policy was a big reason for that. Um, this is getting back to that notion of uh, the privacy. Uh, just take a look at this picture for a moment. This is President Obama and Michelle Obama 
in a freight elevator after a formal event. President Obama has given Michelle his tuxedo jacket. They're having what seems to be a, it's almost an intimate moment, a personal moment there. But look at all the Secret Service guys. They don't want to look at them, you know. <laughs> they're looking at papers, they're looking to the side, looking at the ceiling. <laughs> Let them be by themselves to the extent you can with, you know, five Secret Service agents in a freight elevator. But this is part of that intrusion, the other side, the flip side of the household staff being there to serve the president, the idea of privacy and how difficult it is for a president to have privacy in the White House. And uh, this is, uh, I think, a good example of that. Uh, wherever the president goes, the butlers, the other side of the household staff, again, they're awaiting. What can we do for you, Mr. President? Well, sometimes the president doesn't want anybody to do anything for him. He just wants to do something for himself. But you have this vast staff waiting, as these fellows are, for the president so they can do something for him. But it gets very intrusive, and, and uh, over the years covering the White House, I've heard from many, many staffers at the White House that presidents have a very difficult time feeling that even in their residence, they can't escape sometimes from this uh, notion that they're in a bubble and that they're just surrounded by sort of special pleaders or people who are just uh, trying to do the right thing by them, but don't let them have any sense of a normal life. Um, we'll go back a little bit and talk a little bit about some history here. I start with Franklin Roosevelt in the history portion because I consider him the first modern president for a number of reasons. I show him here with Eleanor because Eleanor, in many ways, helped Franklin Roosevelt to break out of the White House bubble. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt's legs were paralyzed from polio. He contracted it when he was about 39 years old. He never was able to re recover the use of his legs, so he couldn't get around the country as much as he wanted to, so Eleanor did it for him. And she had started doing this when he was governor of New York, and in the presidency she continued because Franklin came to really value it. She became a combination of, of uh, reporter, pollster, uh, just someone who was going around fact finder, getting information. She would, did, did things that uh, first ladies uh, never did, uh, did up to that time. She went out among the people and she'd report back to Franklin what she was finding. She went to migrant labor camps, she went to inner cities, military bases, coal mines, and uh, she realized early on that her marriage to Franklin was not as close as they might have led people to believe. Uh, they were having some problems in their relationship, but Eleanor found that she could be a partner with him in governing by playing this role as the fact finder. So she would have a three-hour dinner with her husband after she made these trips around the country, and she'd have voluminous notes, and she'd read from her notes, and Franklin came to rely on her to give him a sense of how his policies were going over, what the country needed, and uh, what, uh, what was working and what wasn't. Um, it's an interesting story that uh, in initially she, Mrs. Roosevelt wasn't very good at this. She came back one time from, from visiting a residence for the elderly and uh, she said, oh, it's a wonderful place. Um, you should see the menu, the things that they serve the people, steak and gravy and wonderful desserts. So Franklin said, did you look in the kitchen? Did you look in the pots? Did you see what they were really serving the people? And she always remembered that, so she did that from then on, and she became to value this, uh, this, re these reports from Eleanor uh, a great deal. Uh, this is a picture of her at the, one of the, she went to a Pennsylvania coal mine, and she dressed up as a coal miner. She went down into the mine. Again, a very dramatic break from what other first ladies had done, but really served uh, President Roosevelt well. And uh, he um, was able to, use this sense of what was going on in the country in his fireside chats and in formulating his policies and so on. One other quick point about Franklin Roosevelt. As I said, his legs were paralyzed from polio. So he, he was even more into this bubble aspect of the White House than other presidents because of his physical limitations. But he bought a home for polio victims, a, a hospital setting in Warm Springs, Georgia. I don't know how many of you have seen the movie uh, Warm Springs with Kenneth Branagh playing Roosevelt. Uh, he thought he could perhaps recover the use of his legs by going to this therapy center. He was never able to do it, but he kept it, and he was an American aristocrat, so he could have gone to anywhere around the country to uh, get therapy, but he kept going to Warm Springs because he felt he could serve as an example to the kids who had polio and were at Warm Springs. Uh, he would uh, splash around in the pool with them. He would teach them the things that made him feel better, playing water polo, trying to move around in the water. And they didn't think of him as President Roosevelt. They called him Doc Roosevelt. And uh, this is a picture of him at poolside that I always like to show. Uh, he never let the country see this part of him. 
Now look at his legs in this picture. Look how, how you know, reed thin his legs are, very strong upper body. <clears throat> you don't necessarily recognize him immediately, but that is Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, he let his guard down at Warm Springs. You can visit this today. It's now used as a recuperation center for people with spinal injuries, but at the time it was a polio uh, treatment facility. And uh, he loved to go down there. And Eleanor always said that Franklin, because of the polio, learned empathy, which he would not have had before. So it actually gave him a sense of struggle that some people had to struggle in their lives and persevere. And he certainly had to do that with polio. Now, President Kennedy, we're, we're going fast forward a little bit here, but President Kennedy comes into office and he um, uh, came into office thinking that he was going to preside over the uh, superpower relationship. His main focus was foreign affairs, dealing with the old Soviet Union. This is a famous picture that I we talked about at dinner a little while ago of Kennedy. Uh, was taken by a news photographer. He was in the Oval Office and the, one of his staffers said, why don't you come in to the photographer and take his picture? So they s took this picture and it looks like President Kennedy sort of anguishing, his head down, the burdens of office weighing heavily on his shoulders. And it's come to capture that notion in an iconic photograph. But that's not what's happening here at all. He's just reading the newspaper. <laughs> He's just standing at a table reading the newspaper. And it's, it's gotten all invested with all these other notions. But I show it to you because it does actually make it, give you the sense of the burdens of the presidency. And President Kennedy certainly had plenty of those. And we've gone through his, the assassination anniversary on the 22nd of November. But when he came into office, as I say, he was going to be the foreign policy president. But he did listen and learn, which is what I think other presidents should really take from President Kennedy. Um, he did not have any interest too much in domestic policy when he took office, but he started to notice something going around in the country that he finally realized was very important. That was the civil rights movement. Um, he did watch the news. Modern presidents don't tend to watch the news anymore because they're too upset by what they see, the criticism they see. President Obama doesn't watch much news. President Bush didn't either, uh, but uh, President Kennedy did, and he saw the way that the demonstrators were being treated, he saw the fire hoses and the, the attack dogs, the arrests and so on, and he was moved by this um, and by the reports from his own government by this, and he respected physical bravery. He had been a, a hero in World War II, remember the PT-109 uh, heroism where his PT boat was, was uh, cut in half by a Japanese vessel and he rescued some crew members and so on. So he respected physical bravery, and um, then he did pay attention when this bravery of the demonstrators were, um, uh, captured his attention and captured his imagination. At, in 1963, the last year of his presidency, he did define civil rights as a moral issue, which presidents had not done since Lincoln, and this endeared him to many African Americans, and he did go through a fundamental change, but as I say, in the context of the bubble that the presidents are in, President Kennedy did listen and learn. And by the time of the uh, uh, midway through his final year in office, he had more African Americans at the White House in a single event than all of our previous presidents had had total. Uh, and this is this case where he is meeting with the civil rights leaders. You can see Martin Luther King there and various other leaders of the time. So he did uh, undergo a rather dramatic metamorphosis uh, as president. We don't know how much of this would have turned out if he had survived, but certainly as his uh, presidency went on, he was listening and learning, and that I think is important for presidents to do. Uh, Lyndon Johnson took over as president. Here he's signing the Civil Rights Act of 1964, <clears throat> which President Kennedy was pushing for, of course was killed, and so Lyndon Johnson continued that legacy he also signed the Voting Rights Act. Again, there's Dr. King is in the picture. Uh, and, uh, and initially, I think Johnson was in tune with the country. Lyndon Johnson was um, continuing the Kennedy legacy. He wanted to show that our Constitution endured and that he would continue the slain president's policies. And I think that's where the country was at the time. But then Johnson lost touch with the country. He became stuck in the bubble himself. Uh, largely not only because of the Great Society social programs where <clears throat> I think he was pushing farther than the country wanted to go, but because of the Vietnam War. Escalating the war, he said privately he didn't want to be the first president to lose a war, so he escalated and escalated. This is my era. I was uh, in the, the army at the time, uh, so I'm very well aware of all this uh, from personal experience. 
uh, and the country really turned against Lyndon Johnson, but he didn't know how to extract himself or the country from Vietnam. And so he became more and more immersed in this bubble and was, as I said, um, stuck there as a prisoner of the White House because of the virulent, virulent protests that were going on all over the country. This is an example of it. People, I'm always uh, interested, people today say, well, how uncivil our politics are, how much people are bitter and nasty toward each other. Well, remember the chance that Lyndon Johnson would have to deal with? Hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? Uh, that's pretty uncivil, <laughs> but people were really uh, just opposed to the war and he never could get beyond that in his presence. He left office, did not seek uh, re-election in 1968, and uh, retired to, Dow to his Texas ranch as quite a bitter man who felt his domestic legacy was swallowed up by the Vietnam War and uh, that he was not only uh, theoretically uh, captured by the White House, but really was stuck in this bubble, didn't realize how, despite all the protests and so on, how hated he really was around the country because of his war policies. Um, President Nixon comes into office, he escalates the Vietnam War even further. In my book, I talk about him being one of the most isolated presidents we've ever had. You wonder why a person like Nixon could have been elected in the first place, not a people person, uh, had very difficult time making small talk with people, didn't really like the glad-handing part of politics, brilliant man in many ways, uh, did some very interesting and important things, but again was stuck in the White House. As time went on, he insisted that he knew best. He wasn't uh, paying attention to what was going on around the country. He misinterpreted what the country was going through at the time, uh, was reelected, but then it started to fall apart with the Watergate scandal, where first he didn't think that that would catch on as an issue and that he could escape it. <clears throat> he was completely wrong about that. And of course, he ended up resigning from office, our only president to actually resign. This is him leaving on the helicopter on his last day in office. Again, one of the person I identify as one of our most isolated presidents. Um, and um, uh, again, it has nothing to do with partisanship. It was just the nature of President Nixon. Uh, now, we'll come to President Ford, uh, who uh, uh, I didn't cover President Ford, but as uh, we, you were told, I uh, have won his award a number of times. I got to know him after he left the presidency. And President Ford was a man of the people in the sense that he did not forget his roots. And that's very important for presidents who have roots with everyday people not to forget them. President Ford didn't forget them, uh, but he was unable to convey his best qualities to the country and uh, his outreach, his, his ability to uh, mingle and uh, get along with everybody and to um, try to understand people's problems, but he did reach out. I mean, in researching the book, I did find some interesting handwritten notes he had written uh, here at the, uh, at the Ford Library, and uh, one of the, the notes said, um, <clears throat> I have tried my best to reach out to people, and there are some people who will never um, understand me or what I'm trying to do because they won't forgive me for having been Richard Nixon's vice president, and that ended up being true. Um, unfortunately for, for President Ford. But he did reach out. This is an interesting um, picture. Uh, there it is. Uh, of Ford at the White House, part of his outreach. Now, uh, hair fashions have changed a bit since then, haven't they? <laughs> uh, he's here with Billy Preston, which is, who's a famous entertainer, and George Harrison, formerly of the Beatles, and President Ford. He had him at the White House, um, did genuinely try to reach out to people, met with people who had been very critical of him, but it really didn't work. But I always uh, um, credit Ford for trying and uh, didn't succeed, but it was a great attempt that he was making. Um, President Carter uh, defeats Ford in the 1976 election. This is President Ford with Carter with uh, Pat Cadell, who was his pollster. I use this as an example of a president who relied too much on the pollsters. This is presidents try to stay in touch in part by using the pollsters by uh, exhaustively studying the country, what people want, what they don't want. <clears throat> Today, we're, we're just so poll obsessed in our country. <clears throat> you get new polls just about every day, and uh, that's the subject of a whole other, <laughs> other lecture. <clears throat> but Carter uh, was captivated by Pat Cadell, who had just, not, who just been at Harvard. He wasn't out of Harvard very long when he became president of the United States as pollster. And he, he was a very strong inside player. 
He knew how to play the, uh, the bureaucracy, and he became an unrivaled advisor to Carter, and nobody could compete with Cadell for assessing public opinion. Unfortunately for Carter, Cadell was wrong on some very, very fundamental things. Um, he said the country was undergoing a crisis of confidence, and the president needed to, to shake things up and to recognize this, and so Carter gave this famous speech known as the Malaise speech. But unfortunately, based on Cadell's advice, it appeared that Carter was blaming the country for his own failures of leadership, which President Reagan later used in his campaign to good effect. But Carter did try to reach out, particularly initially, you remember he was uh, wearing the sweater to try to look like he was more of an everyday person, cutting down on some of the imperial trappings of the White House. Uh, he actually stayed at the homes of everyday people for a while, initially wanting to, to have a sense of uh, what was going on in people's lives. Now you can imagine how difficult it is to do that and draw anything real out of it. You know, the, the house is inspected, the Secret Service installs phones, they rip out other phones, they look in the closets, they look under the beds, they're everywhere. Uh, the family does not particularly like this. <laughs> and McCarter tried it and then what happened was Big Democratic contributors said, why is he staying in the home of this person? I've given the party a million dollars. Why doesn't he stay with me? So Carter tried it a few times. He didn't like it, so he didn't do it anymore. So it just shows the difficulty of trying to get into an everyday setting that President Carter did try to do. Now, uh, we come to President Reagan. Um, President Reagan um, has gotten a lot of uh, criticism over the years, and while he was in office, for being too attached to the corporate America, rich people and so on, and for devising policies that, um, that help them as opposed to others. Um, but President Reagan, the other side of it is that President Reagan really didn't forget his middle class roots. He had been a middle class uh, young person in the Middle West. Uh, he had been a lifeguard in, uh, in Illinois at a river. Uh, he never forgot this. He said he saved the lives of uh, some 70 people over seven years, serving as a lifeguard in the summers. Uh, the backstory of that is that uh, some of the people who, who uh, were there with him said that a lot of times it was the young women who just were splashing around in the water <laughs> and just wanted President Ronald Reagan to come out and pull them out because they wanted to get to know him a little bit better. So he might have been making a little bit too much of that <laughs> lifeguard business. But nevertheless, I think he did have some sense of middle class America from his younger days. At least he was able to understand the communication part, how to communicate with middle America, which he used to great effect in the White House and uh, actually became quite a <clears throat> popular president, especially after the economy got better in his second term uh, after he defeated Walter Mondale. But there's one other thing I wanted to mention about Reagan to researching the book. Uh, lots of times presidents have a private effort to reach out that we don't hear about until many years later. And Re President Reagan had this. Not only did he have an amazing correspondence with people, he wrote hundreds, thousands of letters over his public life, including when, his, when he was in the White House, uh, had a pen pal relationships with many, many people. President Obama talks about reading 10 letters a night now. Reagan did far more than that. Uh, would write letters back, uh, would have the staff follow up on things that people were writing him about. And he went to an elementary school in Washington and he asked the principal <clears throat> to um, give him the name of a young student he could be a pen pal with. The, the principal gave him the name of a precocious young student named Rudy Hines. I covered Reagan, the end of Reagan, and I never heard about this at the time, but he would go to Rudy Hines' home a very modest place uh, with a single mom, and eat dinner there with Nancy. Uh, they'd have them to the White House. They just they got caught up in a, in a relationship that was valued by both of them. Uh, Rudy Hines, uh, when Reagan uh, died, uh, was at the funeral. He's become quite a successful young man now in the Washington area and always really admired Reagan, but just a, an indication that the, we don't really know the full story about how these presidents are trying to stay in touch sometimes until they leave office. And I did find actually a picture of Reagan and Nancy at the home of Rudy Hines. You can see little Rudy there uh, uh, on that chest. Uh, Ron is eat, interested in eating his dinner from the tray tables. Nancy is trying to talk to Rudy, but uh, they might be a little bit overdressed for dinner, but in any case. Uh, but I thought it's an interesting other take on Reagan and how he did try to break out of the White House that people didn't realize at the time. And a lot of presidents try to do that. So, 
I think that uh, that's one thing he should be credited for. President Bush, the father, I'll speed up a little bit here. This is the famous incident where he saw a supermarket scanner and was surprised at it. Well, again, in so many cases, uh, not to be too critical of my own profession, the reporters who did this story initially got it wrong. <clears throat> He's at an exhibit for uh, uh, advanced technology for a scanner. This scanner, what happened was the fellow in the middle there had torn up a barcode from a product and threw it on the screen and it read the barcode. Now at the time, I think all of us would have been surprised that a scanner could do that. That's what President Bush was reacting to. Not that the fact that a scanner existed at a supermarket, but that it was a very sophisticated one. So this was part of the whole notion that he was out of touch and he never escaped from that notion. I think when he was first elected, as to some extent with President Kennedy, he was a foreign policy president. But unlike with President Kennedy, he didn't really get it as far as what the country wanted from him as the economy got worse. <clears throat> and he did not respond to that uh, very effectively. And so he was sort of captured by his own staff saying, you'll never be defeated by this upstart governor from Arkansas who dodged the draft and is too liberal and had all these charges of being a womanizer. Of course, they were wrong and President Clinton was elected. Now this is during his, <laughs> his difficult Monica Lewinsky year where he did become very isolated, so I don't want to make too much of that, although it did squander a whole year of his presidency. But basically, Clinton was very much a, uh, a people person. He loved to mingle with people, loved to go out, and he was energized by people. And uh, to this day, that's the way he is. I remember uh, many times uh, President Clinton would talk to us in the media. He did pay attention to the media, paid attention to members of Congress, which <laughs> doesn't often happen anymore. Um, he uh, he had a private fax at the White House, remember the fax machine, and people, his friends around the country could send him private faxes that only he would see. So he's, he's trying to reach out to get some input from around the country, uh, and he did try to do this. Um, he, as I say, even with the media, he did try to ask us what we were hearing, what was going on, and I think that was good that he tried to do that. But he would do that, and then uh, he'd come back on Air Force One and talk to us after a trip. <clears throat> and then somebody do a story he didn't like and he wouldn't do it anymore, but then he'd always come back and do it again. <clears throat> so he was always coming back and try to make as many contacts as he could. And so he became quite a popular president, not because of his character, but he persuaded the country that private character should be separated from public leadership, <clears throat> which is a very important distinction that Clinton was able to make with the public. And so by the end of his presidency, people thought that, okay, maybe he's a scoundrel in person, but he's a good president in his policies. The economy was going well, we weren't in a war. So President Clinton was um, able to make that distinction. Again, this is an example of him out among the public, which he loved to do. Uh, just another quick example of how we saw it in the media. I remember we coming back from Australia on a long trip, and um, it's about a 22-hour flight with a refueling stop. I was in the little group of reporters who travel with the president all the time, which we rotate in the press car on Air Force One. <clears throat> Lights are out. We were on the plane for 10 hours. I'm standing there in the dim press cabin with a soda in my hand thinking, how am I going to get through the next 10 hours? There's not much to do. All my colleagues are asleep. And then I hear, ah, oh, kid, how you doing? And <laughs> it's the president all alone. He's eluded his minders. He had on jeans, a t-shirt, and sneakers, and it was just me and the president who were awake. So the, the custom is that you know, whenever you get in a, what's called a pool, a pooled arrangement, you owe to the rest of the press corps. So I thought, well, if I wake my colleagues up, the TV cameras will go on, it'll become a little press conference. Maybe I should just talk to them myself and brief my colleagues later. So what do you think I did? <laughs> I talked to him myself. But it was one of the things you love to get as a reporter because uh, he was so engaged, he was so intellectually curious. Um, he talked about the, the f economy of the Philippines and the uh, holding baby koalas and looking at kangaroos and uh, doing snorkeling in the Great Barrier Reef in Australia and he's, his shadow passed over a giant clam. It was huge, he said. Well, I don't know why he was so impressed with the giant clam, but he was. <clears throat> but you saw this amazing mind that was so engaged by so many things. Now, as I say, as, as we learned from the Monica Lewinsky, he was very self-indulgent, too, because everything was about him. 
But that's the kind of thing you look to see in, in, uh, from a president. And I, I, guess I would think that he might have drawn something from me as sort of how I was seeing them and how people were reacting to him during the trip. And that's, what, of course, what part of what he was trying to do. Um, now, uh, President Bush takes office. This is the famous uh, aircraft carrier incident where he showed up on the aircraft carrier dressed in the flight suit. Uh, He's uh, talking to the soldiers. They had a big sign, Mission Accomplished, in Iraq, which, of course, it was not at the time. President Bush uh, was uh, isolated as president in, in, in a number of ways. He called himself the decider. He said that he, uh, again, there's nothing partisan about this at all. Uh, as Carter was isolated and Lyndon Johnson and so on, uh, President Bush became isolated. He said he did not want to pay attention to the polls, even though the polls might have helped him understand what was going on in the country. Uh, his architect, political architect, Carl Rove, certainly paid attention to the polls and told President uh, Bush what he needed to know uh, on occasion. But Bush uh, felt that he didn't want to pay attention to the polls because he felt he called himself a conviction politician, not in the sense of felonies, but things he believed in, <laughs> that he would do what he thought was right and what he felt was right. And uh, sometimes he would learn the details of policy, sometimes he wouldn't. Uh, and that's, I'll uh, leave it to you to decide whether that was good or bad, but that's the way he did it. And so uh, President Bush uh, pursued the notion of his own agenda, it was a unilateralist in many ways, which a lot of Americans didn't like, but basically this is what he did. One thing that really hurt President Bush was this photo from Air Force One. This is him flying over the damage zone in Hurricane Katrina. Uh, President Bush was at his ranch in Texas on vacation, was not paying attention to the news, refused to pay attention to the news. He gets very stubborn sometimes. Um, his staff said, Mr. President, you need to understand how bad this hurricane was for the Gulf Coast and for New Orleans. He said, I'm on vacation, uh, you know, take care of it. So, uh, mean, uh, so meanwhile, the country is seeing the pictures of these terrible uh, distressed people on the roofs of houses, at the stadium without food or water, just begging for help. Finally, one of his staff members puts together a, 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 almost a newsreel of the news clips to show him what was going on, sat him down and showed him, this is what the country is seeing. Now you're here, really isolated from this. You need to do something. So he finally cut his vacation short. But instead of going to try to boost the morale of the victims or some of the first responders, he flew over the site and they put this picture out. So this became a lasting damage to President Bush as sort of a prisoner of the White House, in, or his ranch in this case, in the sense that he was, he was at 35,000 feet while this terrible tragedy was going on below him. His staff at the time told me, and they still say, that he never recovered his, re, his credibility as a manager or as a sensitive person this compassionate conservatism that he, conservative that he says he was um, because of this incident. He never recovered from that because he did seem too isolated by, his, uh, um, by the White House. Now, let me come to President Obama and then we'll take some questions. Um, this is President Obama using a Blackberry. He comes into the White House <laughs> intent on using the social media, intent on being in contact with people. Um, the Secret Service initially didn't want him to keep the Blackberry because they felt sort of the bad guys would track him now with this surveillance story. We know that they probably can. You know, we know how effective the surveillance stuff is. They could probably hone in and know where the president was from the BlackBerry. But the Secret Service built all kinds of protections into it, so he still uses it. This is sort of another variant of the um, the letters or the fax machine of President Clinton, trying to have people he knows communicate with him directly, so it's not filtered through the White House staff. So I credit him for trying to do that. He does pay attention to the social media, at least. He does look at what's on the internet, the web. He tries to keep in some contact with television, uh, doesn't watch the news very often, but does try to keep in touch with the popular media in many ways, movies, TV shows, and so on. He does read letters. He gets 10 letters a day. He, his White House says he gets 40,000 emails and letters a day. Uh, he, they boil that down to 10. And so he reads them at night. He often reads them to his wife, Michelle. I think he does do that. He does uh, just try, try to stay in touch that way. And I think that's an important thing for him to do. And so that's another way he tries to do it. He does pay attention to the polls. He has brilliant pollsters uh, who uh, just completely outfoxed the Republicans in the last campaign. 
far more advanced technologically and slicing and dicing the electorate, knowing people, what their concerns were, demographic by demographic by demographic. By the way, it, it's quite amazing that they were so technologically uh, brilliant in the campaign and now they couldn't get the health care uh, plan rolling out <laughs> effectively. You wonder how that could possibly have happened. And one reason it's happened is because he was captured by the inner circle. They didn't expand their uh, tension and their focus on this ro crucial rollout of his main domestic initiative. Didn't get a lot of help from industry, from all the brilliant people that they used during the campaign. And so the result was they, were, they had a terrible rollout of this uh, healthcare website that they're still suffering from now. And that goes to the core of his argument that the government can do big, complicated things. That's the heart of the problem he has with this healthcare issue. Uh, they're trying to correct it, but it's just amazing to me, after knowing how they, brilliant they were with technology during the campaign, how they could have let this terrible mess happen with this, uh, this website. Um, this, uh, now, so for somehow we got a little portion of this picture here, but basically this is a picture of President Obama meeting with uh, a family in Great Falls, Virginia. He does try to do this. He tries to get out of the White House and meet with people and try to talk to them about what's going on in their lives and so on. This isn't a picture just of his watch and two bottles of water, by the way. Uh, but for some reason, it's come out just a piece of the picture. But basically, so he does try to get out and mingle with people. But as I said before, in this kind of a situation with all the security and the staff and everybody who's around, you wonder how you can have a, a normal human interaction really in a setting like this outside the White House. Um, we're, we're, uh, I, I, it looks like we have another problem with that other picture, so I'm just going to go to this slide. And just to conclude with the notion that um, the president, uh, of course, has a, lot, a huge number of, of duties and obligations, but one of them really should be in my mind, to keep in touch with the country. It's becoming increasingly difficult, and I think what presidents need to do is to make this a priority, uh, and there's no one way to do it. They have to do many things to keep in touch with the country, and I think the most, president, most effective presidents are the ones who do that most effectively. Uh, if they know what's going on in the country, what the country needs, what the country doesn't want, and so on, they can do that through polls, they can do that through um, the, through letters, through staff, through uh, getting out around the country. One of the things President Obama said, he, one of the mistakes he made in his first term was, was not getting out around the country enough. And he's, he's starting to do that now, uh, much more than he did in the first term. Finally, um, President Obama tries to have dinner every night with his wife, Michelle, and their daughters, Sasha and Malia, at 6.30 each night. He does manage to do this almost every night. It may seem like a small thing, but I think it's important for presidents to do this because it really grounds a president. Uh, there are a few people in a president's life, as in most of our lives, who will be as blunt with you and tell you what you need to know as your spouse. And <laughs> Michelle Obama certainly does this. That speech didn't work out very well. Uh, you know, your policy needs to be clearer. You know, you, you guys blew it on this or that. Virtually nobody else tells a president that sort of thing anymore. It's these idolizers, people protect them, they don't want to add to his burdens by criticizing him. Uh, and the daughters do too. You know, when they have dinner with, uh, with President Obama, they're not worried about his policies on health care or uh, Iran. It's, I got, a, I got a B in my test, and I'm sorry, I should have gotten an A. And, uh, you know, or, or, you know, Johnny doesn't like me. Uh, he, do, he does get that sort of thing. The most basic parental information uh, that the, the he will get at the dinner table, and I think that's really important. So I just wanted to clue, uh, clo close with that notion that for presence and for all the rest of us, uh, if you get into trouble, listen to your spouse. So, <laughs> <laughs> so with that, if you take some questions, uh, you have some questions, I'll be to answer them. Yes. I guess we have a microphone in the back there, don't we? I'm wondering about the other prisoners in the White House, and I'm glad you just mentioned the daughters and the spouses, um, but what about the kids who are trying to um, enter their teenage years, or like the Bush girls, or um, the Johnson girls heading into college? What kind of personal stress does that put on him as a father, listening right. to them say, I don't have an inch of privacy? Right. That's a very good question. And by the way, I don't want to eliminate other people who are in a bubble including those of us in the media. 
We're in our own bubble. Uh, members of Congress are in their own bubbles. Uh, everybody in the House has their own little bubble in their district, and they don't tend to look beyond that. So it's a very common problem in Washington, but I think the, the family is, it's, it's a very good point. I often really sympathize with the President and the First Lady in trying to raise children in this incredibly abnormal environment. Uh, imagine if you were, you know, when you were that age, you're going to school and you get in a motorcade with guys in ninja suits and automatic weapons every day. There are, there are guards outside your classrooms. There are, the, you, know, you, you, you know, you go out with your friends and there's bodyguards with you all the time. It really is very difficult. I remember the Bush twins, the President Bush, the younger uh, twins, uh, when we were in college, and they were so upset at the Secret Service that they would pull up at, at toll booths on an, an interstate or a highway and knowing the Secret Service car was behind them, and they'd pull out and try to lose the Secret Service. Now, that's not the best thing to do. Because you, you, you really want them to protect you. But they were so eager to have some kind of a normal college experience that this is the kind of thing that happened. So, uh, but to, to, to bring it back to the president, uh, the pre pre President Obama and every president, um, President Carter had uh, Amy, uh, uh, President Clinton had Chelsea, the Bushes had their twins, uh, you know, it goes on. Uh, but President Obama is very well aware of trying to have the sense of normalcy. Um, he, he and Michelle have tried to keep the, the uh, Sasha and Malia's lives off limits for the media, and I must say happily that we have pretty much respected that. I mean, there are many stories we could do about the girls that we don't do in order to give them some privacy. They weren't elected to anything, so let them try to have some normal life. Um, one thing that I think was revealing, though, and how much he does think about this sort of thing is that he just said a couple of days ago that uh, he may stay and live in Washington after his presidency is over. And why did he say that? He said because his youngest daughter will still be in high school and he doesn't want her to be deprived of her friends and be uprooted by going somewhere else. Maybe when she's in college they'll do that. But that would be two years after he leaves office. She's only 15 years old. Um, so, uh, uh, so anyway, uh, no, she's only 12 years old, excuse me. So, um, so he is thinking about it all the time, and he's trying to take steps. But I think um, this is an example of uh, staying in Washington, which took a lot of people by surprise, because people thought he'd go back to Chicago or, uh, or somewhere else. But um, he is thinking about that. That would be unprecedented. No president has done that since Woodrow Wilson. And Woodrow Wilson had a stroke, and he was uh, incapacitated, so he really couldn't go anywhere else. So he lived in Washington until he died. But, uh, so that's one example of how it is on President Obama's mind. And the other is this idea of sort of declaring a privacy zone around the daughters, which, as I say, has been basically respected by the media, and I think that's to our credit. So, yes, sir. You mentioned as uh, one of the uh, suggestions at the end of the book about uh, presidents should not ignore the media, and you mentioned your conversation with President Clinton. You also mentioned in the book about how Johnson, I can't remember the reporter who had just interviewed Barry Goldwater and Johnson put him on Air Force One and wanted to pump him with right. that. Uh, Kennedy had uh, Ben Bradley, you know, not exactly uh, a man of the street, right. but uh, do you think it would be wise for a president to establish kind of a personal relationship with a reporter or two or three, say a uh, distinguished award-winning reporter for U.S. News and World Report. Well, that's a brilliant and, idea. And, and would, would a reporter decline that for the fear of losing objectivity or becoming, you know, part of the uh, bubble, the inner circle? Right. Well, that's very good, very good questions. Um, ben Browdy, of course, was the uh, longtime Washington Bureau Chief of Newsweek, became the editor of the Washington Post. He was a very close friend of Kennedy's. Far too close a friend. I don't see how he could possibly have been fair to Kennedy because he was so positive about him. That's the problem with that. The, 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 from the reporter's point of view, the journalist's point of view, you get captured by yourself by the, by the president or the person in office. But I think it's gone too far the other way. Um, I'd like to be able to say when I cover a president that that's the president I know or that's not the president I know. If something happens, I, I like to feel I know the president well enough to understand what he's trying to do. I don't feel I have that with President Obama, and I wish I did. I don't think any of us in the media do have that, uh, because he's kept us at arm's length. And I would say the same thing to a president as I would say to journalists. 
just as we have to evaluate sources, who's trustworthy, who do you want to keep as a source, who is not worth it, who doesn't know what they're talking about, who is fair, who's not fair, we evaluate that all the time. We try to have relationships with people, but we distinguish among people who are good or bad or, or you know, as sources and so on. The president needs to do the same thing. You know, it's not very hard to figure out who's going to try to slam you or who's going to be fair to you or unfair to you. But President Obama and President Bush, I must say, is the same way. They didn't make that distinction. They sort of lumped us all together. And I think that doesn't do them any good. And it doesn't do the media or the country any good because there are reporters who are trying to do a good job. And they, I think they should be rewarded for that. Doesn't mean you have to be the president's best buddy. I think that is a problem if you get too close to a president and you start to uh, to, to, to you know, pull your punches, I think that's, that's very bad. I think we're very, very far away from that with President Obama, but I think that the other part of it is when a president starts to ask you for advice, you know, maybe you get to know the president, but it's, you know, I don't think we should be in the business of giving the president advice. So I think that's a danger sign, which, by the way, President uh, uh, Kennedy did not uh, uh, stop that with, president Bill, with uh, Ben Bradley. He, ben Bradley did give him advice. But um, so anyway, I think it's a fine line, but I think we've gone way for, too far in the direction of uh, distance from the president and distrust and cynicism, and I don't think that's good for anybody. And he's restricting um, both White House photographers now, too. Yes. Yeah, exactly. You follow, obviously, obviously following this, the news very closely. Uh, yeah, what's happened with that is that um, um, this is part of the continuing tension with this White House, as we have with any White House. So it's not like we're in President Obama's pocket, but what's happened <clears throat> over time, uh, we in the press corps have been further and further isolated from the president. When you travel with the president, you almost never get any personal time with him. You used to. Yeah, I'm not telling, talking about being his buddy. I'm just talking about, what did you mean by that in the speech? This sort of thing. We don't do that with him anymore. Um, the senior staff very often doesn't do that either. And uh, so you have this, this, pro this problem of, of isolation. And uh, what's happening with the photographers is that what the White House is trying to do now is put out official staff photographer pictures instead of letting the news photographers take their own pictures. So the news photographers have rebelled against this and say this is little more than putting out press re visual press releases and propaganda, and they don't want to go along with it. The problem is that sometimes news organizations use them because the pictures are uh, generally very good, and uh, they have a hard time resisting. So it's, going to, it's going to take some more backbone, frankly, from the media to, to make this better. But it's an example of this, this rift between the White House and the media that I think is getting worse. So, yes, sir. I have been reading about the money in politics and the lack of time spent in Washington on the part of Congress, and I've noticed that our current president has made lots of fundraising trips. Is this adding to his isolation or not? Well, I, I, that's a good question. About, I think you all heard the question from the mic. Um, yeah, uh, money in politics is a huge problem. I think anybody who studies it knows that. There's a lot of different solutions to it or possible solutions. But uh, if you look at what President Obama is doing, as any president does, as you approach an election, we have a midterm election next November, he's raising tons, millions and millions of dollars for the Democratic Party, as the Republicans did for their party. Does this bring him any closer to the public? I don't think so, because these are generally well-heeled people. Uh, uh, again, you don't get much criticism from these people, except for an occasional heckler. Uh, which happens, but uh, that doesn't particularly bother me. I think maybe a president should have that, that personal experience with people who disagree with him. But basically, um, no, I don't think that going to fundraisers helps the president understand the country much at all. Those are, those are more of the idolizers. They're there to give money to the president. So, uh, and you're right, President Obama has just come on a West Coast swing. He's going on tons of fundraising trips uh, that are coming up all the time. And... Um, it's, uh, it, I think it's a real problem, but presidents feel they have to raise money uh, because it costs so much money to win elections, both nationally and at the Senate and House and state level. So th that's, a, that's a cycle we're in now that's very hard for them to break out of. Yes, sir. Obviously, the Secret Service wants to isolate the president. How much pushback from the president influencing that isolation 
and how much can he break out of it? Right. Uh, you, you get, uh, the question is, uh, how much uh, do the president push back against the Secret Service who try to isolate him? And they do. Um, initially, a president might try to do that. You know, President Clinton, as I gave you the example, tried to clear out this, the bodyguards, the Secret Service, from the residents of the White House, and they didn't want to go along with that, what they did. Uh, president Obama pushed back on the BlackBerry. You know, he said, well, I, I need to have my BlackBerry. And they said, no, you can't have it. It's too dangerous, but they made it work. So the president can make this stuff uh, a little bit back, they can have them back off a little bit more. But generally, after a bit of time, the presidents don't do that anymore because they recognize that they need to be protected, and they do. President Obama gets an extraordinary number of death threats, and I don't think anybody wants to go through a, another Kennedy situation again or a Reagan situation. Uh, but the president is tremendously well protected, and I think pre the presidents themselves understand this. They understand that it's something they have to live with. Uh, and, um, and they do. Um, can there be any uh, backing off from it? I don't see it. I think, if anything, it gets more and more intense. I think the president is stuck in this sort of iron, iron, behind this iron cordon, and it's unfortunate, but that's part of what I write about in the book. It's just, it's just a very unfortunate part of the modern presidency that we live in a country where people, people want to do harm to the president, and that adds to the president's isolation, and uh, unfortunately, that's that's the way it is. So um, I don't see how presidents can break out of it uh, if they want to be safe. I think that's, that's what they got to do. Yes, sir. I'm curious about uh, the uh, phenomena of the presidential press conference. And as a participant, I presume you'd be a good person to ask, right. how cooked is that whole drama? Is that, is the president know who to ask the questions or does he get or does it depend on the president? How spontaneous is it really? Right. And, uh, well, all right, that's a good question. I've, I've gone to the press conferences for many, many years, and I, I could talk about that all night if you want. But basically, uh, it's changed over the years, but in the, in the, the basic point is, starting with President Obama, um, President Obama is, doesn't like to do news conferences. He, doesn't, he thinks we play gotcha with him. We're trying, to, we're trying to catch him and make a mistake, which many of us are trying to do. <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> But basically, presidents who are fast on their feet can, can make us look like sort of hyenas uh, who are, you know, and so they, get, they have the advantage at the press conferences, I think. Um, you might, one thing I think you're probably referring to is that President Obama does not have any problem letting people know he has a list. Other presidents had a list. I think every president I've covered has had a list hidden in the podium in the past, and they'd be very smooth. President Reagan had a list of people he was going to call on. He had a seating chart with our pictures, pasted over our, picture, our seats. We were all assigned seats. So he knew exactly who was sitting where, at least he thought he did. I'll tell you about that in a second. So what he would do, as an example of how this has changed, uh, he would look, they'd have a monitor in the room. They'd get us in our seats 20 minutes early. And so they'd have a monitor panning the crowd. And so his press secretary, Larry Speaks, Marlon Fitzwater, would say, okay, this is Ken Walsh. Call on him, and he'd know who, who's going. Then it was, it was in, it was a list, one, two, three, four, five, seven. Then it was in, it was a seating chart in his podium. So uh, he would, it was a wonderfully orchestrated thing, but he was so smooth at it that people didn't realize that it was all orchestrated. The questions weren't given to him in advance. No self-respecting reporter would give the president questions in advance, so I don't think he was given questions. But uh, what he did was, he made the press conference into an, an amazing spectacle. Um, before Reagan, the president would come in through the side door or something. What Reagan did is he came down that long corridor with that big red carpet all by himself. You know, the, the gladiator heading in all by himself into the lion's den. And uh, it was brilliant, and he invented that. He shows up, and uh, he makes a lot of mistakes at his news conferences. He doesn't know his own policies. Uh, and we would do tallies. Uh, I did them myself. But President Reagan made nine mistakes at his news conference. He made 12 mistakes. But after a while, we stopped doing it because if the economy was getting better, people didn't care. They felt, well, somebody's doing it right, even if he doesn't know what's going on. Uh, there was one, one other quick question about Reagan, a uh, uh, quick uh, point. Um, he uh, would um, uh, like to call on people who had red, wear red. Nancy Reagan loved red. So a woman who had a red scarf on, he tended to call on them. So the women started to wear red dresses, red shoes, red hats. 
the men started to wear red ties, red scarves. One guy showed up in a bright red blazer and he got called on. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes it's like the simplest thing to get the president's attention. Uh, now, fast forward to President Obama. President Obama doesn't care that people know he's calling on people according to a list. He'll, he'll uh, just go to the list, obviously looking at a list. He'll go down and go, let's see, Ken Walsh. Is Ken Walsh here? He doesn't even know if I'm there. He doesn't know where I'm supposed to be sitting. He doesn't care that much about it because he doesn't care that he looks scripted because I think he feels that we have lost so much credibility in the media that he's sort of dismissing us. And, uh, and so, uh, but it's a big change because he, he really doesn't care. Now, what he did, one other quick point about the news conferences. Obviously, I'm warming up to this topic. Um, I, don't, <laughs> I don't particularly care about getting called on a news conferences because I can interview him myself. He does a lot more interviews one-on-one -on -one than he does news conferences. That's better for me because I get him to myself rather than called on in a news conference. But uh, when he does news conferences, it lasts an hour. He generally talks for 10 minutes. You've got 50 minutes left. He gives very long answers. Uh, in the past, presidents would call on 20 to 24 reporters, reporters, someone asking multiple questions. Um, he calls on the wire services because they cover the news conference. He calls on the networks that are covering it live. That's five. So then you got seven people who have given questions. Seven questions, now you're approaching 10 minutes left. Um, he calls on a, a reporter for a minority organization, an African-American network or Latino group, a liberal blogger. Okay, uh, we're all seething in our seats now, thinking we got a minute left. <laughs> he hasn't gotten to the New York Times or US News or the Washington Post or the Wall Street Journal. But he doesn't care because he's rewarding the, news, the, gr the groups that support him and people who are covering the news conference live. That's a big thing. He wants to encourage the networks to cover it live, so he'll call on the network reporters. Although I must say, two news conferences ago, he didn't call on any network reporters because I think he was angry on how they were covering the health care thing. So he was trying to send a message. So, so what I'm getting at is that presidents have a tremendously, have the cards in, uh, to their advantage at these news conferences. And there's not much we can do about it in the media. So that's the short version. <laughs> so any, I, think, I think we're probably out of time. So anyway, thank you so much for coming. And, uh, Talk to you later.